All right, everyone, welcome to 6-1, uh, which covers the pharynx, larynx, and the uh, vocal cords. This video is just gonna cover the pharynx. So the pharynx is, of course, the common muscular tube, uh, common between the airways and the digestive systems. So um, whether it's air going into the uh, larynx or food traveling through the, into the esophagus, uh, this, both of these things have to go through the pharynx first. So the pharynx is this portion outlined in yellow here, or highlighted in yellow, and the esophagus begins below the cricoid cartilage at about level C6 of the vertebral column. We divide the pharynx up into three different portions, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. The nasopharynx is the portion above the uvula of the soft palate, above the soft palate, uh, and encompasses everything behind the internal nares or the coana uh, of the uh, nasal cavity. Uh, so it, uh, anterior to that, you have the nasal cavity. Posterior to that, you have the nasopharynx, which contains the auditory tube and the uh, pharyngeal tonsils. <clears throat> Uh, so there, with the red arrow, is pointing at the opening of the auditory tube. Uh, and here we can see uh, highlighted or, or uh, bracketed the pharyngeal tonsils. There are also tubal tonsils, uh, which span uh, the nasopharynx as well, surrounding the uh, lateral walls, etc. So those are more diffuse, not as well defined as the uh, pharyngeal tonsils. Next. Uh, below the uvula, but above the epiglottis, we have the oropharynx, which connects the oral cavity to the uh, laryngopharynx below. Within this cavity, we have the palatine tonsils, which can be visualized uh, in through the oral cavity. Uh, so you can see there. Next, the laryngopharynx at the epiglottis down to the inferior portion of the uh, cricoid cartilage. Uh, so laryngopharynx there that contains the additus, which is the laryngeal inlet, the opening into the airway. On either side of the opening, uh, we'll see, so the opening doesn't encompass, doesn't travel all the way laterally. It's just a small opening in a wall, uh, like so. And so there's a recess on either side of the opening called the piriform recess. In this next slide, we're going to take a posterior view of the pharynx. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove the vertebral column so we can see the pharynx. Then we're going to make a midline incision and open up uh, the laryngopharynx so we can see the uh, inside midline. So here's the midline which has been reflected open so that we can see the, uh, the uh, additus and the different uh, uh, pharyngeal regions. So we have the nasopharynx here. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, meatuses of the nasal cavity through the, in, uh, the internal nares. You can see the, um, the uvula there with the tongue in the oral cavity. And here outlined in black, you can see the additus, the opening of, uh, to the airway, um, to the larynx. And then on either side of that opening, we see what's called the piriform recess. <clears throat> so uh, this is an actual picture of a bisected head and skull where we can see uh, the different portions of the pharynx, uh, different regions and different structures within it. So here we see the, um, uh, 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 the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the vomer uh, making the nasal septum. We see the hard palate here. We see the soft palate heading down to the uvula right there. Of course, the tongue here, this large um, muscle with fan-shaped fibers within it. And here we can see the internal nares, the opening of the, uh, the nasal cavity to the nasopharynx. We can see this little uh, ridge here. That is the uh, torus tuberus, uh, which surrounds the opening to the inlet of the auditory tube. Uh, what else do we have? So we can see the pons, the medulla heading down into the brain stem, and of course the vertebral column here. So here we can see the epiglottis and the uh, oropharynx between the uvula and the epiglottis. Below that we see the uh, laryngopharynx heading down to the 
uh, cricoid cartilage here, which is this elongated oval shape uh, within. Uh, and so that's the beginning right here of the esophagus. And you can see the narrowing of that sphincter for the esophagus um, there. We can also see uh, what, we'll, what we'll talk about in uh, an upcoming video, which is the voice box. So here are the vocal folds uh, right here within the voice box. Uh, okay, at any rate, let's, uh, let's move on and let's learn about what makes up the wall of the pharynx, the different components and layers of it. <clears throat> and this has um, some consequences that we'll talk about in, in, in kind of clinical uh, relations. So we have, uh, so in this uh, diagram that's upcoming, we're going to be going from uh, deep to more superficial. So imagine we are inside the pharynx, maybe the uh, laryngopharynx and we are traveling outward. So the first layer we travel through as we travel outward is going to be the mucosal lining of the uh, pharynx. Next, just deep to that mucosal lining is the uh, pharyngobasilar fascia. <clears throat> pharyngobasilar, it's the, basically the, the basal uh, portion of the pharynx that, it, that the mucosa attaches to. As we travel through that fascia, we will find the different constrictor muscles of the pharynx. And on the superficial side of those constrictors, we have the bucopharyngeal fascia. So the constrictor muscles are sandwiched between two layers of fascia, the pharyngobasilar, more deep, and the bucopharyngeal, more uh, superficial. So now I've uh, organized that in this uh, diagram here. This is the lumen of the pharynx, the opening of the pharynx. So we were inside the lumen of the pharynx and we are traveling outward through the um, mucosa, which is orange, the pharyngobasilar fascia in yellow, the constrictor muscles in this uh, light blue, and then the teal color is the bucopharyngeal fascia. Now, uh, that is the end of the pharyngeal wall. Uh, as we travel uh, outside of that pharyngeal wall, we're getting into the posterior neck. Uh, and what we encounter next is a space a, the, called the retropharyngeal space, the space behind the pharyngeal wall. Uh, after that, we have the alar fascia here in this uh, lovely fuchsia. And behind that, we have a potential space, which we've encountered before in our neck uh, 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 lecture, the danger space. Uh, so that is a, a potential space that extends all the way from the base of the occipital bone to the diaphragm itself uh, in the mediastinum. And then uh, after that, we have the prevertebral fascia, which covers the neck musculature that is attached to the um, vertebral column. Um, okay, so um, some tech, I've seen some textbooks that have labeled the retropharyngeal space, the danger space, that is not the case. These are two distinct spaces. The retropharyngeal space uh, is, a, is a space uh, that is continuous from the base of the skull, the occipital bone, to the uh, upper portion of the mediastinum, about T4. Whereas the uh, danger space uh, travels all the way down to the diaphragm. So these are different spaces, and um, depending upon the nature of the infection, where it is, it can travel to different areas. Uh, and, um, well, at any rate, they're, they're, they both suck, but, um, yeah, for that matter. Uh, here I've put that um, the, uh, the retropharyngeal space is also separated in the midline by a raphe, a, a connective tissue layer that's fused in the midline so that um, things in one side of this retropharyngeal space don't transfer to the other side. The danger space uh, is the, the longer one. It extends to the entire distance uh, to the diaphragm. Uh, so anyway, you've seen this picture before. This is the danger space here uh, between the prevertebral fascia and the alar fascia. Uh, so just uh, expounding upon uh, that. And then the teal color, the bucopharyngeal fascia 
uh, anterior to the uh, alar fascia. Uh, so anyway, you can take a look at, at uh, this diagram to get an idea about where those spaces exist. Um, <clears throat> but moving on, let's now talk about the musculature of the pharynx. The, there's a number of muscul uh, muscles. Three of them are constrictor muscles. You have a superior, middle, and an inferior constrictor, but there's also uh, muscles that help to uh, tense or elevate portions of the palate um, or the, um, the pharynx itself to uh, facilitate the movement of a bolus of, of food uh, through the uh, portions of the pharynx. So here first we see the superior constrictor muscle labeled in blue. So it's the most superior. It uh, is, uh, attaches in the midline to the pharyngeal raphe, which I just uh, you know, mentioned in terms of the retropharyngeal space. So the uh, pharyngeal raphe here, which uh, attaches to the occipital bone in the midline. Now the superior constrictor is discontinuous uh, superiorly, so it doesn't extend all the way up to the occipital bone. Uh, there is the, uh, so in this portion you can actually visualize the uh, pharyngeobasal or fascia, the deeper structure deep to that muscle. Uh, and then the um, auditory tube will be perforating that fascia. Okay, uh, so you can see here the occipital bone, the little X there, that's the attachment point in the midline for that pharyngeal raphe. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, so here is a lateral view of the superior constrictor muscle attached in the midline to the occipital bone and the pharyngeal raphe and extending uh, anteriorly. Um, so uh, it will attach to a, uh, an anterior raphe as well at that point. Um, so anyway, you can see uh, it does not uh, attach to the hyoid bone. Uh, it's attaching to that raphe. So let's move on to the middle constrictor. Now the middle constrictor attaches laterally to the hyoid bone, especially the greater horns of the hyoid. When we have the, um, the vertebral column removed, you'll be able to, or even from the anterior, you can palpate uh, the, ant the horns of the hyoid bone. Uh, and so that is the attachment point of the middle constrictors. And you notice they make this uh, almost diamond-shaped um, kind of pattern here. Um, and so you'll be able to see the superior constrictor uh, deep to the middle constrictor as, as the pattern of the muscle fibers changes. Now, as we get to the level of the greater horn, uh, the hyoid bone, then we're starting to give way to the inferior constrictor, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but diving between the superior and middle constrictors, we'll see the stylopharyngeous muscle uh, shown here in green. So we can see the uh, superior constrictor, stylopharyngeous diving deep to middle constrictor here in red. And on the posterior surface that you can see from this view will be the glossopharyngeal nerve, the, uh, the uh, SVE fibers of glossopharyngeal nerve innervating stylopharyngeous and forming the uh, pharyngeal plexus with vagus nerve on the posterior surface of the constrictors. Okay, so moving on now to the inferior constrictor, we can see uh, that that travels obliquely and is attaching to the thyroid cartilage as well as the cricoid cartilage. Uh, so um, the key to identifying these constrictors is to just understand the angle of the fibers and the landmarks as, where, as to where they begin and end. So no big deal there. Now we have taken that posterior view, we've sliced it down the middle and we've opened it up so we can see the inside of the pharynx down into the esophagus even. Uh, so one thing we're looking at here is the uh, palatopharyngeus muscle, uh, which is the uh, palatopharyngeal arch, the posterior arch, which is behind the uh, tonsils uh, there, the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, palatine tonsils in the oropharynx. Um, okay. All right, so uh, go ahead and moving on. You can see it here in yellow from this, uh, in this posterior reflective view. 
and also from this view, we will uh, be able to see potentially the uh, salpingopharyngeus muscle, but we'll definitely be able to see salpingopharyngeus from the bisected view of the skull. Uh, salpingopharyngeus is connecting from the uh, torus tuberis of the auditory tube down to the, um, um, uh, the, the pharynx itself, the mucosal lining of the pharynx. So you can actually see here, this is the medial view of salpingopharyngeus. Uh, so when it's covered in the mucosa, it's called the salpingopharyngeal fold because it's the fold of mucosa covered over it. Uh, you can uh, open this fold up and see muscle fiber, very thin, very small, uh, narrow muscle fiber uh, attaching from the auditory tube uh, down into the pharynx. And it's uh, the name salpingo actually means trumpet. So it's the muscles that attach from the trumpet to the pharynx. And the auditory tube, of course, looks like the bell of a trumpet. So that's how it gets its name. Uh, what is new on this slide? Okay, so stylopharyngeus, uh, we'll be able to see that from this reflected view inserting into uh, the, uh, the uh, laryngopharynx around the attitus. Uh, so you'll be able to see that as it has traveled through um, superior to the uh, middle constrictor down to its attachment around the attitus. So now I'll take a quick look over um, the process of, um, of swallowing. So there are stages to swallowing. There's an initial voluntary stage, and then there are uh, involuntary stages where the vagus nerve and glossopharyngeal uh, end up taking over and, and performing the, the program sequence of muscle contractions to push the bolus into the esophagus itself. So the uh, voluntary phases are, are uh, A and B here, where you're using your tongue to compress the bolus against the palate, the roof of your mouth. When the, um, when the bolus uh, impacts the soft palate, then that indicates uh, that the, um, the, uh, the involuntary phase should take over with vagus nerve and glossopharyngeal nerve. So at this point, the uh, soft palate is elevated to close off the nasopharynx and the nasal cavity from the oropharynx. And the uh, constrictors and the suprahyoids uh, elevate the, the, um, the epiglottis and the larynx, the hyoid bone, uh, in order to push the epiglottis down to uh, fold the epiglottis over because the epiglottis is cartilage, so it's flexible. So every time you swallow, that epiglottis folds down to cover over uh, the attitus. Boom, like that. Uh, then the different constrictor muscles uh, sequentially contract to push that food down into the esophagus, where uh, peristalsis of the smooth muscles of the, the uh, GI tract take over and start pulsating that food down into the stomach and ultimately, you know, you know where it goes. So on this slide, pharyngeal uh, muscles that we haven't really talked too much about yet, but are still important, especially in the swallowing process. Uh, I have labeled four of them, or out, high, circled, uh, you know, rounded, rectangle, whatever you want. I don't know. We'll just, just go with it. Uh, different colors here. So down here on the bottom, the vagus nerve is innervating the uh, levator valli palatini and the salpingopharyngeus muscle to elevate the soft palate uh, and to elevate the pharynx. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, two muscles innervated by trigeminal nerve, which are part of the swallowing process, kind of an ancillary component. They don't contribute to the swallowing mechanism, but they're important uh, in that these are the two tiny tensors, tensor valley palatini and the uh, tensor tympani. And if you'll recall, these uh, are going to um, uh, function on closing off or, or muting the sounds uh, coming through the auditory tube into the middle ear so that our, the chewing sounds and our vocalizations as well uh, don't uh, overpower 
and rupture our middle ear, um, the tympanic membrane, and, and uh, etc. So uh, that's that. Now, this is a picture of that, that posterior view. The vertebral column has been removed so we can see the muscular pharynx. We can also see the internal carotid artery uh, and the internal jugular vein. So uh, internal jugular vein coming from that sigmoid uh, sinus and the internal carotid artery here going up to the, uh, or the carotid canal. Other things we can see in this view. Uh, so we have the sympathetic chain, uh, which contains the superior cervical ganglion, the middle cervical ganglion, down to the stellate ganglion. We see vagus nerve here medial to the carotid artery. We see some other very important landmarks. We see the greater horns of the hyoid bone. Uh, so attached to the greater horns of the hyoid bone is the middle constrictor. So we can see those fibers traveling up in this kind of chevron pattern uh, and going down below the inferior constrictor. So here we have the inferior constrictor heading toward the, um, the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage, which you can't see. Uh, what else? So on this side, we can see stylopharyngeus muscle, uh, just a very brief portion of it, and glossopharyngeal nerve uh, riding on top of it and then branching to form uh, SVE components of the uh, pharyngeal plexus. Now, um, what I'm teaching you is that the um, glossopharyngeal nerve only innervates stylopharyngeus. The um, true innervation is a lot more complicated than that because of the complexity of the pharyngeal plexus. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it's not quite uh, fully, um, you know, explained in anatomical terms, uh, these innervation patterns for the pharynx, for the constrictors. You'll find some textbooks that do say that vagus contributes to um, the pharyngeal constrictors and glossopharyngeal does also. So uh, just, you know, roll with the punches, go with it, and um, as far as this class is concerned, stylopharyngeus nerve is doing, um, or glossopharyngeal nerve is doing uh, the stylopharyngeus muscle. Um, so we can also see the superior constrictor above the middle constrictor. We can see that pharyngeobasilar fascia here. Um, so at any rate, uh, very interesting view there where you get to see a lot of these cranial nerves that we haven't seen before uh, and the sympathetic chain as well. Uh, so that's all I have for this video. Uh, I'll see you on the next, uh, next round.